If you have your Bible, turn with me to Mark chapter 2. And uh, this will be our last visit in Mark uh, for a little while, because next Sunday uh, we will take up our, our summer series in 2 Peter chapter 1, which uh, has at the center of it the longest single sort of meditation on how assurance of salvation works anywhere in the New Testament. None of them are all that long, but, but for about five, six verses in a row, Peter talks about what it looks like to make your calling and election sure, certain. Uh, and so that'll be, uh, that'll be what we'll be looking at uh, throughout the summer. We'll do the whole uh, chapter uh, but then, in the fall, we'll come back and pick up in Mark chapter 3. Uh, as Don mentioned, you come back tonight, uh, Exodus 16. Um, probably the most famous quotation of Jesus in his temptations in Matthew 4 is, Man shall not live by bread alone. That's the pithiest of the responses. Man shall not live by bread alone. Well, that's from uh, Deuteronomy 8.3, but Deuteronomy 8.3 is commenting on the events of Exodus 16. So there's, that's, that's one thing. Then my brother's going to be here tonight, uh, and his wife, Sherry, they've been in, uh, now it's called Whitset, British Columbia, for 42 years. I've been here for 33 years, which tells you, if we come someplace... We're hard to get rid of. Um, could, could be a long time, a long stay. Um, but uh, the, the, they'll be sharing uh, tonight about their work there. So that's the second thing. And then after that, there's cookies. Now, come on. Uh, so you can come back tonight. That's a trifecta. Uh, Exodus, uh, missions uh, report, and, uh, and cookies. Uh, that'll start tonight at... Uh, Six o'clock. Let's stand together. Uh, Mark chapter 2, verses 23 and following. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields. And as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave to those who were with him. And he said to him, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, it is you who have founded for us an eternal home. The psalmist says it's you who founded Jerusalem on your holy hill. But we know through Christ that the ultimate fulfillment of Jerusalem on that holy hill is new Jerusalem and a new heaven and a new earth where glorious things will be spoken forever and ever of you in your city, the city of our God. 
And Lord, in fulfillment of the great promise that you gave to Abraham, that through him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. There will be representatives from those nations all around the world, from the remotest parts of the world. As we noted a couple of weeks ago, herders in Mongolia So we'll hear tonight native people in British Columbia, Europeans from a vast array of countries across that continent, Africans from the vast array of countries in that continent, and on we could go. And as the psalmist says, in the end, it will be as if they were all born in Jerusalem. It will be as if they were all the seed of Abraham, for spiritually and eternally they are in Christ. So, Father, we thank you for your church around the world in this day where in all of these cultures, with these countless backgrounds, you have counted up your people and written them in the account. And it's just as if they were Jacob. It's just as if they were Judah. For they are in the ultimate fulfillment of Jacob and Judah. They are in Christ. Lord, may we sing your praises as those who fall in their number, those who have fallen heir to the everlasting promises, to the everlasting hopes of everlasting life that have come to us in Jesus Christ. Make those promises our hope and our stay. Make them our strength in the midst of trial. And we have many who are in various aspects of trial, some quite severe, some in long, drawn-out bouts of trouble. Whatever the trouble, whatever the trial, may the thought of the everlasting springs of hope in the new heaven and the new earth that have become ours through Jesus Christ, through knowing him, be our comfort this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. There used to be a half hour radio program on a lot of stations all across the country, not just Christian stations, uh, by, uh, run by a guy as a trombone player uh, by the name of Bill Pierce. Um, Bill Pierce died 2010 at the age of 83. He was on the air with that program, however, for about 50 years. and, uh, and, and you can still uh, hear those broadcasts. I think they're even on the radio in places where they're just playing reruns. But I, I, uh, I hear them. I tend to hear one every Sunday morning right at 5 o'clock um, in this room, walking around in here. And I listen to one of those half hours of Bill Pierce. It was called Night Sounds. He's got a real measured sort of melodious voice that tends to be calming and encouraging, and he plays, he would say, quite a wide variety of music, but most of us would think that he's fairly, he's fairly traditional. Well, not that long ago, he had, uh, he, and he, he gives a little title to each one of his broadcasts, and uh, not so long ago, his little title was Hymn Stories, and he told uh, the story of one of our more famous uh, actually, three of our more famous hymns, but the first one's the one that I'm 
interested in. He mentioned the fact that Charles Wesley uh, wrote uh, 6,500 uh, song lyrics. Um, actually, the, the Canadian Baptist pastor, uh, Arnold Dalmore, who is a very, very thorough researcher in his, or his biography on Charles Wesley, Dalmore claims that Charles Wesley wrote 9,000. 9,000 lyrics, and I'm suspecting that Dalimore did a lot better research than most people do in one of those, um, you know, hymn history books uh, as he studied the life of Charles Wesley. The most famous of all of Wesley's hymns is uh, a lyric called Jesus, Lover of My Soul. And the church came very close to never having seen that hymn because Charles showed it to his older brother, John Wesley, the more famous and certainly the more dominant of the two. And, and John didn't like it. Uh, John Wesley thought it was far too sentimental. Um, and... Uh, you know, and sort of told him to go back and try again. Uh, but he didn't just show it to John, he showed it to some others, and apparently enough liked it uh, that it would go on to become his most uh, famous and beloved lyric. Uh, the opening verse is the one I think that John most objected to. Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to your bosom fly. Well, the nearer waters roll, well, the tempest still is high. Hold me, O oh my Savior, hide me, O oh my Savior, hide. And this is what people like. Till the storm of life is past. Hide me, O oh my Savior, hide. Until the storm of life is past. Safe into the haven guide. Oh, receive my soul at last. Too sentimental, thought Wesley. Now that hymn put me in mind of another one that's certainly more guilty of, uh, of, of if John Wesley didn't like that one, he would have really hated C. Austin Miles' line. He never heard it because Miles was a century plus later but most of you will recognize it. C. Austin Miles wrote that uh, hymn, In the Garden, which has this refrain in it, speaking of Jesus. And he walks with me and he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there is like none other we've ever known. Very sentimental. He walks with me, and he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. Now, I mention those hymn lyrics because the, the opening verse of our text for this morning paints that sort of sentimental picture of Jesus' connection to people, to disciples, it's quite a sentimental picture. Now, I'm not making a comparison between John Wesley and the Pharisees, but the Pharisees do not like this picture as they see it in real time. They don't like it at all. And they object to it, which creates our story, our text uh, for this morning. Let me reread it to you. So here's the sentimental picture. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. There's the picture. Jesus walking with his disciples on the Sabbath along the edge of a grain field. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? 
And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest. Now, if you go ahead and read that story, you'll see it wasn't Abiathar the high priest. It was, it was Abiathar's dad. But Abiathar is the only one to survive what came out of this story. Uh, and so Jesus mentions Abiathar, maybe to let them know, I know this is a problematic story I'm referring to. Abiathar being the only one who survived this visit that David made. How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. That idealized scene is what we pick up. Now I'm going to divide it into five, which any homiletics teacher would tell you, that's too many. Don't make a five-point sermon. But I'm not being graded anymore. Uh, so I can, I can do that, and, 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 and you can grade me if you want. But, um, um, you know, like I say, I've been here for 33 years. I don't get offended easily. Um, so, uh, but five points. And so they're each going to be fairly quick. Each going to be fairly quick. State our thesis this way. It is crucial for disciples to grasp hold of the lordship of Jesus, which is where this paragraph ends and which is what most of our songs were about that we sang together this morning. The lordship of Jesus, the importance of Jesus, the majesty of Jesus. That's where the story ends. Uh, but here's where it begins. Number one, five considerations. Consider the picture of discipleship found here. On the Sabbath, he, or one Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields. And as they made their way, his disciples began to cluck, pluck the heads of grain. Now, this is probably the fourth or fifth time already, and we haven't been in Mark very long. I'll just remind you again of Rodney Decker's little summary of what you're supposed to look at when you're reading through the Gospel of Mark. It's a really helpful summary. Mark's purpose is related to discipleship. He works it out paragraph by paragraph. So here we are, new paragraph related to discipleship by challenging his readers to answer two interrelated questions. Who is Jesus? That's what we end it with. And what does he expect from those who follow him? That's where we begin. What does he expect from those who follow him? What does he hope from those who follow him? That they might walk with him. And here they are in this opening picture. The disciples walking with Jesus. Uh, Jesus, who is a really big deal. As Decker says, paragraph by paragraph. Last, last week, we looked at the fact that Jesus is such a big deal. He's like, he's like new wine. You can't just sow him onto any old life. Our, our new patch, you can't sow into any old life. New wine, you can't pour into any old wine skins. It's got to be appropriate. They've got to match. Jesus must cause transformation. He must cause transformation. Now this picture, this picture that we find here has a, a really powerful Old Testament counterpart, right? And we, we, we recognize the Old Testament counterpart more quickly than we recognize what's going on here. Genesis chapter 5 is sort of uh, the proof positive that God was not exaggerating or lying when in Genesis 2 he said, if you eat of the tree of this, the fruit of this tree, you will surely die. You will surely die. And you get to Genesis 5 
And sure enough, after one generation after the next, they're all, they're all dying. A little pattern. He lived and died. He lived and died. He lived and died. He lived and died. But then you get three quarters of the way through, and you read this remarkable break in the action of death. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God. After he fathered Methuselah 300 years, and he had other sons and daughters, and these were all the days of Enoch, 365 years, Enoch walked with God. And he was not because God took him. Life and death, life and death, life and death. And in the middle of it, this grand possibility that there is the possibility for a man or a woman to walk with God. It's just inserted there. And Enoch walked with God in the midst of the death and the dying that was going around all around him. Well, his culture was spiraling down toward destruction through the flood. This man Enoch showed up in one of those generations. And he walked with God. Well, that's the little simple picture that Mark paints us at the beginning of this paragraph. Talk about, talk about an idealized picture of a Sabbath situation. Disciples walking with God. Disciples walking with God through a field on a Sabbath afternoon. That's the picture here. Uh, I mentioned that little uh, phrase from the uh, uh, football uh, commentator uh, a couple of weeks ago. Doesn't get any better than this. John Madden liked that phrase. Doesn't get any better than this. Well, a good biblical theological commentator would point at Mark 2.23 and say, it doesn't get any better than this. Disciples walking with Jesus on a Sabbath afternoon. That's as good as it gets. And one Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields. And as they made their way, his disciples, as they made their way, the disciples began plucking the heads of grain and eating them. Secondly, second consideration, consider the legalistic distortion of this picture. Verse 24, and the Pharisees were saying to him, look or behold, why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? It's as if they're blowing a whistle, calling a foul, right? So you got this peaceful scene, peaceful scene. All of a sudden, you know, you got, you know, disciples uh, walking with God. And then here comes a Pharisee blowing his whistle. Foul! Foul! That's the picture. He was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain, and they call a fowl on it. Now, what they have in the back of their mind, almost certainly, is Exodus 34, 21. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. This is both in plowing time and in harvest. See, so what's the fowl? Harvesting. These guys are harvesting. Wake up, Jesus. It's the Sabbath. These guys walk with their harvesting. They're doing exactly what Moses told them not to do. Man, Jesus, you're clueless. Wake up. Smell the coffee. The guys are harvesting all around you. Smashing the Mosaic law. It's a disgrace. That's what they're saying. That's what they're saying. Now, this again, see, this is a, this is a warning to us. Um, look out. As we, as we, as we said uh, 
last week. You know, you don't want to. You don't want to say, well, if God says one thing, if you ramp it up a little bit better, you'll automatically have yet holier situation yet. Uh, so, um, you know, we use the illustration. So, if God says, "Don't get drunk," then then absolutely, you know. Be, be like me, be a total abstainer. And then, whoa, now you're like super far from drunk and super sanctified. Relation to alcohol, there's nothing like the total abstainer. You know, it's like at the top of the line. <laughs> Just be careful of that. No, it says be careful of that. It doesn't work like that. Well, of course, we have some of that here. I mentioned to the guys this last Thursday morning we're in institutes, Calvin's Institutes, and we're in this exposition of the law, and we're on the fourth commandment. And I remember in my first church down in Iowa, their uh, older lady in that church, her sister, had taken a job teaching in Orange City, Iowa. Well, if, you've, if you're around here, you know uh, Orange City, Iowa, Sioux Center, Iowa. These are famous. These are uh, Dutch communities, uh, Dutch Reformed communities, that theological tradition uh, takes, the, takes the Sabbath quite seriously. And, uh, and this, uh, uh, this is a woman from a Scandinavian uh, uh, background, ra- raised in the free church, you know, used a little more laissez faire. She started teaching over there, and then the Monday, one Monday morning came, and uh, she, just before school, got called down to the principal's office, as, as I shared on Thursday, and the principal said to her, well, uh, you know, we got, we got a call this morning, and, uh, um, you know, somebody, apparently, uh, they were taking a walk yesterday, and, uh, and, they, and they didn't, meet, they, I mean, they weren't spying or anything, but they happened to look in your window, and they saw that you were ironing clothes. Um, yesterday being the Sabbath. You were ironing clothes. It'd be better not to do that here in Orange City. Um, you don't iron clothes on the Sabbath. Maybe do your ironing on Saturday instead. I don't know what the principal was thinking when he said that. I'm pretty sure I know what the person who called was thinking, helping out this teacher. I mean, um, helping her to take seriously the Sabbath. See, because what I was doing on my Sabbath was walking around, making reports on Sabbath violations. <laughs> um, but, well, but didn't realize that, right? That's, I mean, th- this, is how this, this is how this sneaks up on you. No, I was thinking, think, I, I, was, I was just out minding my own business, and then I stumbled, and, and then it's like, oh, wow, I didn't realize it. My divine calling, I need to call the school because I've seen this. Well, look out. Look out. So the question is, what is really going on here with these Pharisees? Critical, maybe a little uh, proud. That's what think Jesus thinks he picks up on. And as we move thirdly, his response to them is kind, sort of, but very blunt. Uh, his response tells us what he thinks, how he diagnoses the situation, I think. Thirdly, consider the rebuke of Jesus to this distortion, because they are going to be accused of a distortion here. Um, here we have the longest little section of our text under a point, two verses. He said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful to do, but for the priests to eat, 
And also he gave it to those who were with him. See, they tell you to Jesus, wake up, man. Behold, they're harvesting around you and you don't even notice it. What's the matter with you? What kind, of, what kind of operation are you running here, Jesus, with harvesting disciples on the Sabbath? And Jesus' response to them is this. Have you guys ever read the Bible? You ever heard of the Bible? You ever heard of the Hebrew Bible? That's an insult. Have you guys ever, have you guys ever read, you ever heard of David? He's, the story's about David. You ever heard of that? Well, they are experts on David. What do you mean, ever heard of David? Ever read 1 Samuel 21? We got 1 Samuel 21 memorized. You ever read 1 Samuel 21? Huh. Now, if you go back and study this, this is, uh, this, this is, this doesn't, you, you could make a case. This, is, this doesn't seem to be like a great decision for Jesus to pick this story. Because uh, this story does not end well. This story does not end well. This story ends with the murder of 85 people in the priestly household. Abiathar being the only survivor because David is lying in this story. Priest asks him, what are you doing here? Oh, special mission. He's not on a special mission. He just, he just found out that Saul is trying to kill him, and he's fleeing. Special mission from the king. Uh, got my young men meeting me. Uh, the mission was so pressing that we left without any food so we could use some help there. Well, you know, the priest says, I don't really have anything uh, but the consecrated bread. Your guys, they're all, uh, they've kept themselves from him. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. We don't even know if the men are really there. Uh, we suspect they are. Jesus seems to think they are, so I'll go with him. But in the story itself, you don't know what to think. You don't know what to think. So what in the world is Jesus doing citing this story in 1 Samuel 21, 1 to 7? Let me read it to you again. Russ already did, but let me read it again. Then David came to Nob, to Ahimelech, the priest, and Ahimelech came to meet David, trembling. And he said to him, Why are you alone? And no one is with you. Like, you wouldn't be running for your life, would you, David? Why are you alone? And no one with you. And David said to Ahimelech the priest, Oh, the king has charged me with a matter. And said to me, let no one know anything of the matter about which I send you and with which I have charged you. And I have made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread and whatever is here. And the priest answered David, I have no common bread on hand. But there is the holy bread. That's the piece that he's interested in. Technically speaking, should David and his men be given this bread? No. No. Are they given this bread? Oh, yes. Is there any negative comment by the author of 1 Samuel about them being given the bread. Oh, not at all. In fact, this is a positive story about how David's life is saved from Saul.
course, Jesus is the son of David. He's the Messianic king. David is a type of Jesus. So that's the only point Jesus wants to make. Have you guys ever read how Samuel speaks of the kind of technicalities in the law that you're jumping up and down about? That you think you know exactly what it means, you think you know exactly what the violation is. Have you ever read that story? Because if you had, it would give you a little pause for being so pompous and sure of yourselves as you're just being right now, if you had read that kind of story. Good reminder to all of us, right? See, there's no, there's no, there's no heroes in the Bible that ever stand, you know, like, Snow White's wicked stepmother before the mirror, you know, or remember her? Mirror, mirror on the law, who's the most beautiful of them all? You are. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the holiest of them all? You are. You are. Oh, you're so magnificent. You dot every I, you cross every T. What a magnificent soul you are. If you're not careful, you'll think of yourself a little bit that way in certain areas. It's a deadly thing to do. It's a pharisaical sort of move. Very attractive, very tempting. But this, don't do it. Don't do it. Fourth, Consider Jesus' conception of the Sabbath. Verse 27, it's incredibly positive, right? Here's what Jesus thinks about the Sabbath. Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. The Sabbath is designed to be a great blessing to a person, to the people of God. We think of the Sabbath that way. The more conservative you are, the more danger you're in of thinking of the Sabbath of, of kind of a minefield that you have to sail your ship through. You've got to look out that you don't hit the wrong stuff. There's all kinds of stuff there that you're not supposed to do, and there is. There is stuff you're not supposed to do. There is a broad. Uh, but the conception here, is completely different than that. Uh, Jesus doesn't say, the Sabbath was made as a test so that you could go out and show how much you love the Lord by staying away from all the best stuff for a day or two. That's not his conception of it at all. His conception, rather, is, the Sabbath is a monumental opportunity to be grasped. Well, opportunity for what? Well, exactly what this story opened with. His disciples are walking with God. They're walking with God, the Son. What an opportunity. What a picture. That was the absolutely ideal Sabbath experience. Disciples walking with God. They got a day. They got nothing else to do but be with Jesus and all across the field they go. And it's an absolutely perfect picture. The Sabbath was made for that kind of opportunity. Wow! Fantastic! What a gift! What a gift! I love how Psalm 73 closes. Psalm 73, verse 28. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. The NASB, even a little bit more striking. Here's how it puts it. Just switches the one phrase around a little bit. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. 
The nearness of God is the best thing that can happen to me. The nearness of God is the great opportunity of my life. What the Latins would refer to as the sumum bonum, the best of the best, the top of the top. The nearness of God is like that. You know, in our modern day, when you, you bring up something and, and somebody who's a little bit more tech savvy than you, they'll tell you, well, there's an app for that. There's an app for that. And when it comes to the nearness of God, well, you've got Jesus saying, there's a day for that. God has set apart a day for that. It's right in the law. The Sabbath was made for that. Help you with that. Attach you to that. Ground you in that. There's a day for that. Great news. There's a day for that. Now, as Americans, we got to look out. You say, well, I like those. Let's, let's go back and beat up on the Pharisees a little bit more. Because um, uh, that way, because then, then we can take the Sabbath stuff the way Americans take it and want to take it. There's a day for you to do whatever you want. And you can sanctify it however you like. Call it good. Now you might have a meaningful Sabbath experience where you didn't really think about God at all. Isn't that cool? That's impossible. It's not how it works. It's not what it means. There are all kinds of freedoms. But you got to watch yourself, we as Americans. Whatever, whatever, whatever. That's one of our favorite theological words. Whatever. Whatever. I'm pretty sure we're good to go. Whatever. Nearness of God is my good. Well, yeah, but I got some really interesting hobbies too that I don't want to discount. The nearness of God is my good. There's a day for that. Jesus is, that's what he's saying. The Sabbath was made for man. There's a day that gives you an opportunity to take a run at the greatest opportunity in your life. It's not that that's the only day in the week you do it, but there's a day focused on that so that you can walk with God the other days of the week as well, that you'll be more likely to do it. Fifth and finally, consider Jesus' claim of personal identity. And this is basically just a conclusion. It's the last little, it's the last verse, verse 28. So the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. That is, Jesus is teaching us how to think about the Sabbath Jesus is the ultimate decider of what is good and bad on the Sabbath. Now remember, Jesus doesn't ignore anything in the Old Testament. In other words, Jesus would not, Jesus would not be fine with the average farmer going out in, in his day uh, and harvesting on the Sabbath. He's just going to run the combine all day on the Sabbath. I don't think he would be jumping up and down about that, but he said, what the, this is not harvesting. This is not harvesting. You, can't, you don't get to call somebody on a technicality like that. You're being ridiculous. The whole spirit of the law is bent in a different direction. Spirit of the law, is, it's just all about the nearness of God, walking with God, trusting God. It's a great opportunity. It's a big opportunity. And when it's done at its finest, you see, it looks like where this story began. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields. Jesus was. And as they, his disciples, made their way, his disciples were plucking heads of grain, and there they are, walking with God on the Sabbath. It's remarkable. It's a sentimental picture. And he walks with me and he talks with me. 
and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as he tarries there, as we tarry there, is like none other I've ever known. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields. And as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, may we see our opportunity of knowing you as our great opportunity. Oh, Lord, keep us from pride and self-focus and legalistic superiority. Keep us from careless confidence, ruinous self-confidence. But at the same time, keep us attuned with you. Keep us among those with hearts that know that being near to you is the greatest thing that has ever happened to us. That it's the greatest thing that can end, ever happen to anybody. And you've given us a day to enjoy that, to look into that, to walk in the midst of that, today for us, for our good. Bless us, keep us, strengthen us, deepen us, fill us with your joy. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.